Hello, 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 hello. So uh, give me a shout out if you can hear me and see my screen. So welcome to another Z Classroom live stream. So today we're gonna be covering uh, some more trial usage, going over some of the basic stuff, and then we're gonna focus today on covering Spotlight. So we're gonna use Spotlight to make some uh, shapes from just simple alphas, so 2D textures. And then we're gonna take those and generate a little weapon part. Uh, a little greebly piece of machinery, hard surface stuff um, out of that. So to start off, uh, this is gonna be another beginner stream. So I've been covering all these. Uh, here at Pixelogic, we've been going through and doing a dev stream pretty much every day. Um, so we've been trying to get at least one of our developers streaming. So if you guys are at home uh, looking for stuff to do, you can try out ZBrush. We have a trial available you can download. This will give you 30 days of uh, ZBrush to test out, and it's going to be full featured. So there's no watermarks or any restrictions on any of the features and the trial. So if you download it, you can test it out, see if it fits your pipelines, and go from there. Um, with the trial, uh, it will work on a Mac machine and it will also work on a PC. It will not work on an iPad or a, rather an iOS device. So if you, you will not be able to use ZBrush on an iPad. So we've had a few people that have downloaded it for an iPad and it will not work on that. So you need to have a Macintosh or a PC machine, so Windows or Mac, and then the trial will work on that. In addition to the trial, we also have the bridge that you can evaluate as well. So at the bottom of our trial page here, you see there's also the ZBrush to Keyshot bridge. So if you're interested in testing that out, you can get both of these. You can try them out for free and then see how they work for you. So I have a little more things to go over and then we're going to get into ZBrush here and go into Spotlight. Uh, this is a live session, so if you guys have questions, um, once again, I'm going to be focusing more on beginner type elements of stuff, trying to say, you know, get into the format of, hey, I just downloaded the trial, uh, what can I do with it? So if you have some questions that are advanced, I may be able to cover them at the end, towards the end of the stream, um, or are just through like pointing you where to go to kind of find the answers. So ZBrush also has multiple ways you can get into the application as well. So if you've downloaded the trial, you figured out you really like it, and now you want to end up purchasing, uh, we have single user subscriptions or single user subscriptions for monthly uh, and six month and then we also have perpetual we have never charged for a upgrade so one thing about zbrush and some of the other sets us apart from some of the other software is that we don't charge for upgrades so there's no yearly fee or contract um, for the software if you buy perpetual and then we've never charged for an upgrade in addition just the professional version of zbrush which is used in film games tvs movies medical field, everything. Um, we also have ZBrush Core, which is our light version of the software. And this has a lower price point because it doesn't have all the bells and whistles that the professional version has. So we have a monthly version of this that's going to run you about $10 a month. Uh, some of our other developers, uh, Daisuke and Solomon, are going to be doing live streams here uh, during this uh, pandemic, focusing on ZBrush Core as well. So if you're interested in seeing how ZBrush Core differs from the professional version, um, you can definitely download uh, or watch one of their live streams uh, during this time. And you should see a little blip uh, down here towards the bottom right here where my the cursor is kind of going. And this is going to show you what dates they are going to be streaming at. So that's Solomon right there. And he's going to be doing ZBrush Core on April 23rd. Paul's running uh, Do You Know That Live, so more advanced stuff. So if you have like a real technical question, uh, definitely pop into his streams and he'll be able to cover those for you. And then I'll have another stream on April 24th. So Wednesdays and Fridays are my days around 2 p.m. All right, so hopping over to ZBrush here. So I'm gonna come in for the first few minutes here and just kind of describe some of the things inside ZBrush. Um, this isn't gonna go as in depth to the basics as the first stream I did for the ZBrush Live, our Z Classroom Live, and that's gonna cover more of the basics. So if you do a search on our YouTube channel, there's a replay of that. Just do a search for Z Classroom Live Sculpting a Bust. And if you just downloaded the trial, I highly recommend checking that one out because it's very low level. It's gonna go through how to save, how to navigate, what this crazy thing is at the top here is, and just kind of all those kind of different elements. So definitely um, check that out. Um, question from Brian in the chat asking about uh, ZBrush Core to ZBrush. So there is an upgrade path from ZBrush Core to ZBrush. 
Um, I think it's maybe about the same cost, um, but there is an upgrade path from that. So I think you get $100 back. So if you bought ZBrush Core and then you upgrade to the professional version of ZBrush, you'd get a offset of, I believe it's $100. Um, but don't quote me on that. Uh, if you go to the Pixelogic store, there's information on there. So to start off, I've just launched ZBrush here, and this is what you should be greeted with um, when you load it up. Up here at the top, we have this thing that is called Lightbox, and this can be open and closed by clicking this little icon here. And it also can be toggled by using the hotkey of comma on your keyboard. Uh, inside of ZBrush, if you hover over any button and you hold down control, this is going to give you a little uh, help note that's gonna pop up. And so you can scroll over or hover over stuff You'll see if there's a hotkey and then if you hold down control on your keyboard, you're gonna get a little pop-up that's gonna tell you what that feature is kind of doing. In addition to that, that, if you have any other questions about interface items, if you come over here to the help area and click on this um, search online docs link here, this will take you to the online docs website. In there you can type in the search term and it'll give you more information too. So if you ever get stumbled or like, well, what does this button do? You know, you can hover over it, hold down control, it'll give you some information there. And if you want more information, go to the help area and click the search online docs. Um, with Lightbox here, Lightbox is a browser for looking through files that ZBrush has. So kind of think of it as like the bridge inside of Photoshop. Now one thing nice about using Lightbox is you're going to get a preview of the ZBrush files. So the file formats for ZBrush are generally uh, ZPR files, which are ZBrush project files, and then you have ZTL files, which are ZBrush tool files. So if you're just new to ZBrush, basically you want to start with ZPRs. So you can see all these files in here will be coming in as ZPRs. And the difference between a ZPR and a ZTL is that a ZPR is gonna save your entire scene. And a ZTL is only gonna save tools that are over here in the palette. Um, one thing you don't wanna do if you're using inside of ZBrush is if you wanna save your stuff, make sure you go to the file menu right here. There is a document area over here that has an open and a save as. However, this isn't going to save your 3D assets. It's only gonna save a document or basically a 2D version of your scene. Um, so it was used for 2.5D. So if you need to save anything and it's your first time, I'd say go to file, save as. Uh, you can also use this quick save button right here, which will deposit a quick save of your scene. So if you start working on stuff, you can just come up here and quickly click this, and that's gonna save everything that you have going on currently. Now, if you want to access those quick saves, you can go back in the light box here, and then there's this quick save tab here. And in here, you'll have a area you can come through and just double click on these, and these will save or load your quick save files. Uh, if you hover over anything inside of Lightbox as well and you click on it, you'll see the path of where this file lives on your computer. So if you want to access it locally, maybe back up your quick saves, um, you can navigate to that folder on your machine and then copy those files and do what you want with them. So you can hear some uh, existing quick scenes from some of the uh, last Zcrafting lives I did. So that is where they live in Lightbox. So today we're going to start out with just a simple cube project. And so we're going to grab this cube ZPR here, and then we're going to load this in and we're going to start manipulating this cube with a process called uh, Snapshot 3D, which lives in another area of ZBrush called Spotlight. So I'm going to come over here and click this cube. And if you just have a ZPR file and you click it inside a Lightbox there, it's going to automatically load it in and you'll automatically be put into 3D mode. Yes, if you have any questions in the chat, uh, we got some questions here. Um, yes, you can ask. Um, if it's really high level stuff, I may not be able to cover in this stream because we need to focus on, I'm trying to focus on more of like the beginner usage of ZBrush here. But if it's uh, something I can cover, definitely I'll try to, ask, try to answer it for you. So with this cube here, you can see as it's loaded in, I just went to Lightbox, double clicked that ZPR file for the cube, and it now loaded in my scene. Now, inside of ZBrush, there's a few ways to navigate. So the first way is if you just click off your model and drag, this is gonna allow you to rotate. As you're rotating around, if you hold down Shift, this will end up locking your object to a world axis. So front, back, you know, all the different sides, so just rotating and holding down Shift. I have a keyboard here too that I'm gonna bring over so you can kind of see the hotkeys I'm using here as well. So you can kind of get this information. So just clicking and dragging, you can see over here my mouse button is held down and I'm just rotating. And so I'm off canvas, clicking on a blank spot and dragging and that's gonna form a rotate. And then if I hold down shift, it's gonna snap into those different angles. Now, in addition to the, just the rotation, you can perform a pan. This can be done by holding down the alt key and then clicking in a blank spot and moving. 
and this is gonna go through and pan your model. So you can rotate and then hold down Alt and drag and that's gonna be able to pan. Now the next one's a little bit, kind of could be a little bit tough, especially if you're a new user to ZBrush and this is the zooming in and out aspect. So one thing I recommend for, especially for new users, if you're kind of getting lost with navigation, there are some buttons right here this uh, move, zoom, and rotate, which are gonna do the same processes. So if I wanna move, I can just click this button and drag. If I wanna zoom, I can click this button and drag. If I wanna rotate, I can click this button and drag. So if you're getting lost in navigation, you can definitely come over here and use these. Below this, or actually above this, there is a frame button too. So if your model goes like all the way off screen like this and you wanna get it back, just come over here and click frame and that's going to bring that model right back and there's two toggles for this so if you click it once it may frame to part of your mesh and if you click it again it may frame to all of it so if you don't get what you want the first time when you click frame click it again because basically it has the ability to frame to your entire scene and also just to frame to that one single object so if you click frame and it zooms in too much or zooms in too less just click it again because there's two states for that button now, another thing I want to hit on quick, especially for new users, is these options at the top here. So we have a scroll, a zoom, and an actual. Now, what these are used for is 2.5D, which is basically the canvas space on your screen here. And these are going to move the canvas of your model, but they're not going to allow you to zoom in your mesh. So if oftentimes as a new user, if you come over here and you click zoom, instead of using the zoom 3D down here, you'll be able to zoom into your model, but basically what it's doing, it's kind of doing like a digital zoom for a digital camera. So it's just taking that image and zooming it in. So if I move my object now, you're gonna see this stuff's gonna start getting blurry. So you can see how it's pixelated up here and down here, because what it's doing, it's taking the image and you're just zooming into the image. So it's basically working like a digital camera or say the zoom option inside of Photoshop. Now, if you do this by accident to get it back, all you need to do is come over here and click this actual button right here. And this will go and take your canvas and go back to that one-to-one -one ratio instead of having it zoomed in. And now your model should be back to looking the way it was. Uh, one other thing that people often run to, and I don't think I've, I should have talked about this in all my uh, streams, but I don't think I have yet is that if you're used to using hotkeys and other applications, you may hit the shift S or option on your keyboard. And what this does in ZBrush is it creates a snapshot. And what this snapshot does, it takes the model that I had in 3D and it's going to drop it to the canvas here. So it's basically like taking it and just dropping it down. Now, this becomes a problem um, if you do it by accident because now I can only see my model when it's not <laughs> inside this dropped version of it. So to get rid of this, you just need to hit Control plus N on your keyboard. So Control N, and that will clear the canvas out, and now you'll be left with just your 3D model. So that process again, if you're used to saving in other applications, the hotkey may be Shift S. So if I have my model positioned here and I click Shift S, this is gonna perform a snapshot. And now I have two of these, but one of them I can't rotate around or move. So that's what snapshot is doing. And if you have this happen to clear it out, hit Control N on your keyboard, and that will now clear the model out and you'll get back to that single 3D object. All right, so that's the basics of, say, navigation and moving your model around. If you want to deactivate perspective, you can come up here and turn this on and off. This is going to come into play today because we're going to be using this spotlight functionality. And with this functionality, you're basically taking 2D images and you're going to project them kind of like a CAD drawing almost, and it's going to shoot geometry through your model in one axis. And so if you have it in perspective, you may not be able to clearly see exactly what you're trying to do. So for this tutorial today too, definitely uh, turn perspective off. So I'm gonna leave these questions here quick. So Life Lover is asking, what do you think is the best use for spotlight generated objects? So I'd say the stuff I'm showing today is probably gonna be what, what's what generally I use it for. So hard surface elements are what I end up using the uh, spotlight uh, generate objects for. It's gonna give you really nice objects with hard edges. Um, definitely it's isometric kind of drawing stuff too. So you're shooting it through left, right, top, down. Um, so it's not gonna really, it doesn't really have the ability to give you like curves and soft lofts. So it's not gonna really give you organic shapes, but it's awesome for any sort of hard surface processes because basically you can use it, uh, what I'm gonna show you today, is you can use it with just simple alphas. And so anyone can take an alpha, you can make an alpha, it's just a black and white image basically. And with that, you'll be able to generate a shape. And it's, it's a very simplistic process. Um, so it's another way to base build or mesh build inside of ZBrush 
um, in addition to the other elements. So <laughs> hard surface is where I'd say that one goes, life lover. Um, checking out this other one. So we have a question about modeling an axe and the sharp edges of the axe get lost. So in the uh, last uh, series I did, which was uh, using the Boolean system, um, I went through some processes where you can use the zero measure to go through and have edges basically creased. Um, and these can be creased by using an option that lives in the geometry tab, crease area here, and that's gonna hold that edge. Um, and the basic process I covered like what the zero measure does versus what Dynamesh does. Um, so if you have an ax and you've gone and you've got this nice sharp edge, uh, if you Dynamesh that model, it's gonna soften that up. And so that's probably what's happening with your item there. So it's losing that edge because Dynamesh is gonna flood topology all the way through your model. Um, so what I'd recommend doing is um, check out the last Z Classroom Live I did. So on Wednesday, there'll be a replay on that on YouTube. And I went through and used um, the Boolean, uh, just covered the Boolean processes uh, was what that one was. But I do generate like a ring and then cover, you know, after you're done with the ring, you have these nice sharp edges. But what happens if you, you know, Dynamesh it, you get this result. What happens if you Z-Remesh it, you get this result. Um, but if it is a Dynamesh model, you're probably gonna have to go in and use, say, H-Polish and Trim Dynamic to flush that edge back out. If you still have like a low-res version of it, you can use a crease and that's gonna keep it harsh. But if it's a Dynamesh model, you're gonna have to pretty much manually going to do it. You can do some polishes with polygroups too. Um, but there, are, you know, it's, there's a lot of ways to get it back, but H polish and trim dynamic are pretty good. All right, so I've got this cube here, and if I turn on my polyframes, you can see it looks pretty good. And if I go to the geometry tab here, you can see I have some subdivisions. So what I wanna do now is I wanna just take this model and I wanna convert it to just a Dynamesh ob object. And briefly, we just talked about Dynamesh here. And what Dynamesh does, it's going to take your model and it's going to flood it with new topology. So 100% new topology is going to get flooded in the model. And with this, the goal of Dynamesh, the usage of Dynamesh, is that Dynamesh is going to through and making sure that every area on that mesh has a consistent resolution. So that means it has a consistent surface. So if you sculpt from one part of your model to another, you're going to get a stroke that's continuous. So as an example of this, with my cube here, this is the one I just loaded in the light box here. And I'm gonna come down to the Dynamesh area. So this is Tool, Geometry, Dynamesh. I'm gonna type in a resolution of say 256. And the resolution option here will just set how many polygons or how much density the model will have. So if this is a lower version of it, when you go to Sculpt, your details are gonna be less detailed. But if you have a higher resolution on this, you're gonna get more detail. So as an example of this really quick, if I do it, say something low like 128 and then Dynamesh the model, you're probably gonna get a little dialogue with this object telling you you have subdivisions. Uh, we're just gonna click no to this. We do not wanna freeze them. So if that pops up, just click no. Now here is a Dynamesh with a resolution of 128. So if I come across the surface and just click and drag, this is gonna find a sculptural mark. And let me change my brush here too so it's a little bit easier. So I'm gonna switch my brush to get a different one just to demonstrate this. Uh, ZBrush has a whole wide range of brushes in here and these can all be accessed by coming up here and clicking this icon, which is gonna open up the brush palette. You can also press B on your keyboard, which is going to pop up the list of default brushes that are loaded. In here, then the default brush area at the top here, so there's this quick pick area, you should have a brush called Clay Buildup. And what this brush does is it has an alpha a link to it so you get more of this squarish shape as you're sculpting on your model. Um, I did a whole thing on the first Z Classroom Live on sculpting a bust, which covers a lot more in the brushes, but just a quick thing here on how to select that brush. And now if I take this and drag it across my surface here, you can see at a resolution of 128, this is what I'm getting. So my model topology or geometry consists of squares that are about this size, right? So these are polygons about that size. So as I'm sculpting across the surface of the model, it's taking that surface and it's pushing or pulling it. And how that looks or how much detail I get as I perform this process is going to be dependent on how much geometry the model has or how tiny those squares are that consist of the geometry. So at 128, this is the resolution of the size of the squares I'm getting. Now if I up this to say 256, and then to redynamesh, you want to just hold control and click off, and this will reprocess the model here. I want to make sure that actually processed there. And now if I make that mark again, 
we didn't get it. Hold on. There we go. Now, if I click and make that mark again, you can see how I'm getting more fidelity. So that is basically what this resolution slider is doing. It's making those squares on my model tinier or the polygons on the model tinier, giving me more resolution to sculpt details on the mesh. So when I talk about resolution, it's gonna be related to that process. So for this mesh here, I wanna give a decent amount of resolution. So I'm gonna go and undo this. Control Z on your keyboard will undo any processes you do. If you wanna redo those processes, the hotkey is Control Shift plus Z. So that will redo, Control Z will undo. So I'm gonna change my DynaMesh again to 256 and any sliders inside of ZBrush, another element, definitely if you're new to ZBrush, um, is definitely if you type anything into a slider, make sure you hit enter on your keyboard to lock that value in. There are some times where the slider may not process that value and so if you type it in, you may not get a result you want. So just make sure if you type anything in that you hit enter. And then after I have this processed, you can see this is what my cube should be looking like and now I'm ready to start using the Spotlight functionality. Now with Spotlight, this lives in a little menu, it's kind of hidden here, and it's based around images. So you can use textures and you can also use alphas for this process. Now to get in here as quick as possible, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into Lightbox and I'm gonna load in a Spotlight file. So Spotlight allows you to save these different images and you can save them into a file. So you can then open this file up and all those images will be already there. So to get to this, let me move my keyboard down here. Let me go back in the light box by opening this up here or pressing comma on my keyboard. At the top here, there is a Spotlight area and I'm gonna select this. And then in here we have a few uh, default presets that come with ZBrush. So if, to use this here, if it's your first time, definitely go through this method. Um, coming in here, going to Lightbox. After Lightbox is open, navigate up to Spotlight here. And in here, you'll have some Spotlight files. Now, the one we're gonna use today is this hard surface Spotlight file right here. And to load this in, we're just gonna highlight it and then double click. And that is now gonna load that in. Once it loads in, you'll see you have these alphas that are coming into the side here. And at this stage, you can't really do anything. You've got them loaded here, and if you move your model around, they're just kind of sitting there, but you can't really access them. So this is turned on Spotlight and loaded into our scene, but it hasn't come through and given us our ability to manipulate these images yet. So to manipulate these, there's a hotkey associated with this, and that is the hotkey of Z. So if you press Z on your keyboard, you'll see you're gonna get this Spotlight wheel that's gonna come in. So if you hit Z again, it's gonna go away. Z, it's gonna come back. And then if you hit Shift Z, that's gonna hide it. So Shift Z will show and hide Spotlight, and Z will show the Spotlight wheel. So those are little hotkeys there, and if you have Shift Z to hide it, you can bring it back, and then Z to bring the wheel back. So this is a main element here of Spotlight. So if you go, what happens, why did it vanish? Just hit Shift Z, it'll bring it back, and then hit Z to get the wheel. Now, in addition, if you come up here to the texture area, there is the spotlight options here. They can use for buttons. So this is texture on and off, and that's gonna do the same thing. And if you see, if I hover over this, the hotkey is set to that Shift Z. So that is what Shift Z is controlling. That is the button location. So if I hit Z, we're gonna get to the spotlight wheel here. Now the spotlight wheel here allows you to come through and manipulate these alphas that are loaded into the scene. So all these alphas here are just different alphas that we can then use and generate shapes from. So with this, if I click and drag anywhere on my canvas here, I'm able to move all of those. And then if I wanna isolate one of these, I can just click it and then drag it and I can just move that single one. So this is the functionality of Spotlight. So we have all these images. If I click off and drag, it's going to move them all around so I can move them anywhere on my canvas. And then if I click on one of them, you'll see it's gonna get highlighted, and then I can move that one. Now, when you have one selected, you'll see these little pips that are gonna appear in the corners here, and these are snap points. So this allows me to move this wheel and snap it to different areas. Because when we control stuff with this spotlight wheel, it's gonna allow us to manipulate this alpha. So to move the wheel, you just need to get into this inner circle here and drag this around. And as you see, as I get to these different corners here, I'm gonna be able to snap to that image or that alpha. So I wanna snap right to the middle here and then I'm just gonna scale this up. So to use the spotlight wheel, it has all these different options. And if you hover over this, you'll kinda of get 
uh, information on what's happening with them. Uh, more advanced information is available through the uh, online docs, but for here, you pretty much are just gonna get the names of what they do. And so the one we're looking for first is scale, and to use anything on the spotlight wheel, you click and then you drag, and this will allow you to perform that action. So if I wanna scale this alpha, I'm just clicking and dragging. So I find the scale, click, hold down, and drag, and I can now scale that alpha. Now after I have this alpha scaled, I can now position it around my model. And the key thing here is that we're gonna use these alphas and we're gonna position them somewhere in our scene based on that initial starting shape we had. And now we can come through and use these to add another piece of geometry that you can then manipulate for this form. So before I get into this really quick, let me check these questions here because it just got flooded. <laughs> so let's see here. These are the same position like mine. So Jupiter's asking, can we move the face in the same direction while keeping edges in the same position? Like in Maya, we just have to extrude. So Jupiter, there's ways you can just mask uh, points on your mesh and you can move them around like that. Then we also have a whole brush called the uh, Z Modeler brush. And I did a whole, there's a Z Classroom Live I did based on modeling a tire. And now will go through and how you can go through and select say faces and then use extrusion processes uh, to extrude those out. You can also move those individually and have them raise up and down. So I'd recommend checking out that. Just do a search for Z Classroom Live um, on YouTube and uh, Tire, and you should be able to get that live stream. Uh, so it's, it'll be just set up just like this one here, but that should give you hopefully some information you're looking for on how to manipulate that model um, and get what you're looking at. So the side effects is asking, what's the theme of today's stream? The theme of today's stream is spotlight and using snapshot 3D with booleans. So we're gonna be making a little bit, a little weapon part here and show you the power of taking these alphas and modeling with them. Uh, let's see here. So Leardon, uh, a little bit more advanced thing is asking how to select more than one polygroup and move it with the gizmo. Uh, your best thing for that would be to isolate the polygroups by visibility and then use masking just to mask those areas and then move them with the gizmo. Um, there is a way you can use the uh, transpose line and the gizmo to s select, you know, unmask areas of polygroups quickly by holding the control key. Uh, so that's how I'd say go by doing that. Side effects also would like you to know that the uh, size of the model does affect how DynaMesh will work. So the larger the model, you will need a higher resolution to get the details you want. And definitely if it's small, you're gonna need a uh, different resolution based on the size of your mesh. And there's a whole thing on the uh, scale and how DynaMesh works. There's an internal scale inside a ZBrush and DynaMesh at a resolution of 4096, which is that slider here um, coming through at a model size of two is going to give the maximum uh, polygon count you'll be able to get out of a DynaMesh. Um, I believe I have some Ask ZBrush videos on that too. So if you do a search for Ask ZBrush DynaMesh, there's some more information on how DynaMesh works with uh, resolution. Still gonna fuse some of these. Let's see what else is here. There's a lot here. <laughs> Thank you, Life Lover, glad it helps. So web etching is asking about the transpose tool. That's a whole nother thing in itself. Um, I'm probably not gonna get into that today. The Gizmo 3D is the default now and it's a lot easier um, to go into, uh, but definitely uh, the transpose tool is its own little beast. There's some uh, videos if you search for just transpose tool, there's a lot of information on it, but, and also in the online docs in the help area up here. So Pedro is asking, does ZBrush have a memory limit or memory usage where we can crank up all the settings for best performance? So ZBrush will run at optimal performance on your screen. It's gonna try to take everything. It will take everything your computer has and it will suck it dry. Um, so by default, that's its default state. You launch ZBrush and ZBrush is like, I'm taking everything. It's gonna take your entire system. Uh, this is one reason why if you have a Mac machine, it's gonna take everything and that Mac will kick its fans on like instantly because ZBrush is like, oh, you've got this power, I want it. And so it's gonna go through and take it. Um, so you don't have to worry about ZBrush reaching the um, like 
over, you know, setting ZBrush to reach its memory like as much as it can because it's going to try to get everything. Um, you can dumb it down some if you go to preferences and go to performance. Uh, you can decrease things like the max thread, um, is which what I do here during streaming just so that ZBrush isn't grabbing everything and it gives uh, OBS a little uh, <laughs> processor power to use to uh, stream this out to you guys. But definitely uh, ZBrush is always going to try to go through and suck everything. So it wants memory, it wants Chrome. Um, you know, memory and then cores. So yeah, if you have Chrome open right now, it's gonna suck, suck everything out of it. So you can turn it down by going to preferences and use this max threads. But in general, you don't have to set anything to say, hey, ZBrush use everything. It's gonna use everything. All right, so back to my thing here. So once again, to select one of these, just click on it and then you can move it around. So with my shape here, what I wanna do with this is I wanna come through and I wanna cut out a little form. So I'm gonna use these alphas, and with these alphas, I'm just going to take these, and I can generate a 3D element from them. So if I come over here, and let me move my keyboard so I can see these. I'm gonna come through, I'm gonna grab, say, this shape right here. So you guys see that? And I'm gonna position it, and make sure, first of all, that the transpose, uh, the spotlight wheel here is centered onto that alpha. I'm gonna scale this up a little bit, make it a little bit bigger here. And then I'm gonna reposition it so it kind of fits like this. And when it's fitting like this, I can definitely scale this a little bit more. So I end up with this result happening. Now, after I have this alpha lined up with my geometry in my scene, what I can do now is I can use the snapshot 3D function. And this is gonna take this alpha and it's gonna turn it into geometry. Now, what it's doing is any part that is 100% white is going to get solid when it gets generated. Anything that's got this 100% black or zero value on the image is gonna be a negative. So with this shape here, when I click the snapshot button, it's gonna take this alpha and anything that's white, it's gonna generate geometry from. So just think of it as it's taking that image and it's generating mesh wherever that image is and then it's gonna generate the depth of that image based on whatever subtool I have selected. So if I come over here to the tool palette and open up the subtool area, I have that cube. So this cube has a certain depth or Z value on it. So when I have this alpha here and it's the one selected, it's the one that's highlighted, and I click snapshot 3D, it's going to now take that alpha and generate a new subtool from it. So you can see now I have generated this subtool from this alpha. Now if I scale this down and then say move it over here, and click Snapshot 3D again, it's gonna do that same thing. So whatever I've highlighted, it's gonna look based on the world I have in here, and when I click it, it's now gonna generate a new subtool. Now if I hide Spotlight by holding Shift and Z, now you see this is what I have in my scene. So I have that initial cube file, I'm gonna activate Solo here. This is the one we started with, and we dynameshed it just so it has a little bit even topology. I have this object, which is the first one I created here, and then I have that small one that I could create it over here. Now you'll notice that the thickness or the depth of all these is based on the first tool I had selected. So I had this cube selected, so all of these contain the same thickness. So one key element here when using this snapshot 3D option is it's going to look at the subtool you have selected and it's going to base its depth on that. So that's a key thing right there. So, with this, let's see, we've got this, this, and this. Now let's look at the geometry that was generated from this mesh. So I'm gonna just select the one I wanted right here. I'm gonna activate solo so I can kind of see this. And this is what the snapshot process is doing. So if I turn on my polyframes here, you can see it's generating a pretty dense mesh. So it's taking that alpha, it's generating a front face from that alpha, and then it's extruding the geometry back from that face and then generating the same back face on the other side. So the topology in the middle here is all just one line coming from the front to the back and just running straight through. So if you're new to ZBrush, you don't have to worry about this, but if you have never done any 3D modeling, this is just giving you one edge that's basically, or well, multiple edges here that are all just one subdivision all the way across. So there's no vertices in the middle here. You have a vertice here, this is one edge, and then a vertice here, and it's going like that all the way across. So this is really nice um, because in ZBrush here, if I need to change the size of this, I'm not gonna get any overlapping topology. It's very easy if I just now select the Gizmo 3D, I can then perform, say, 
a scale in Z like this. And this is gonna allow me to scale this to whatever size I want. And I don't have to worry about, you know, points in that geometry there like overlapping or making a messy mesh. mesh. So it's nice to be able to make these shapes and then you can manipulate them. Now with the third object here, if you don't want anything you've created, you can always delete them. So I can come through and delete this out. So I'm just gonna click delete there. Um, you'll get a little dial that's gonna pop up and ask if you really wanna do it. I'm gonna hit okay. So that has now removed that subtool and that process was just going to the tool palette, subtool area, selecting the subtool you wanna get rid of and then clicking delete. So now that I have these two objects in my scene, what I wanna do is I wanna kinda focus on the Boolean process inside of ZBrush. And the last stream we kind of built on the Boolean, so we showed how you can use that to generate simple shapes. And for this, instead of using primitives, we're gonna use this spotlight geometry and then combine it with the Booleans to get the results we want. So instead of taking a model and modeling it to get our shape to subtract, we can just use the alphas, generate our shape, and then subtract. So with my cube here and my object I generated, I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna activate live Boolean and then I'm gonna come over to the subtool area over here. I'm gonna to go to that subtool that was just one I was created from, created from the alpha and I'm gonna activate the subtractive option on it. And you'll see if I have live Boolean on and I have at least two subtools in my scene here, one set to this positive option and the other one set to subtractive, I now get this. Now this is all preview right now and the stream before this, we've covered uh, the live Boolean process a lot more. So if you have any additional questions on that, you can definitely uh, check out that stream. Now with this here, it is in a preview mode. So what this means is it's in a non-destructive form. So if I come up here and do a move scale or rotate to get the Gizmo 3D, I can then manipulate this subtool and this is gonna allow me to tailor the effect on that mesh. And if I activate my polyframes here, you can see this is the object I'm moving. So I'm moving this one here and with the live Boolean option turned on and my subtool set to the subtractive form, ZBrush is subtracting this in a preview mode. So I can come through and now manipulate this shape here, modify this anywhere I want, and it's gonna subtract or show me what it would look like if that form is subtracted out. So now I'm ended up with this shape. Now the key to what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be doing that same process. So we're gonna use these alphas to generate these shapes and then we're gonna add them in positive ways or subtractive ways to get what we're looking for. So I'm gonna rotate my model to the top here. I'm just turn off the floor there. And let's go back into Spotlight. So I'm gonna hit Shift Z on my keyboard to bring this back and then press Z to get that Spotlight wheel. So now that I have this shape and I've cut out that one with this other one, what I wanna do now is I wanna come through and bevel this edge a little bit. So it's a little bit too harsh for what I want. So I wanna generate another alpha over here and bevel that out. So I'm gonna come over here and I have a few that are already set up with this default. So this one here has a nice rounded shape here and then it also has a pointy shape. So I can take this, make sure my wheel is centered on the middle there, scale this up and you can scale it up a few times to get it to a correct size. I now wanna perform a rotate option and the rotate's gonna happen wherever you have this little wheel positioned. So if I have it positioned in the middle here and I go to rotate, it's gonna rotate in the middle after you make any change inside of Spotlight, if you don't like that change, you can definitely still hit Control plus Z on your keyboard and undo it. And then if I wanna say not rotate from there, but may I wanna rotate from here, I can snap to that point or I can just position it right here. And then I can perform the rotate there and you're gonna see it's gonna rotate from there. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have these alphas and then we're gonna manipulate them with the Spotlight wheel till we get them where we want them. And then we're gonna generate the geometry from those using the Snapshot 3D. So I'm gonna rotate the model here and I'm gonna rotate it in 45 degrees. Then I'm gonna reposition this. So it's generating something like that. I can scale this up a little bit more. And with this shape I have in the alpha, if I scale it up, I'm gonna get less of a cut, right? So it's taking that edge and it's, you know, kind of bending it out so it's not as astute, acute. So I'm gonna move that to say here. So that looks pretty good there. Now, once again, you can snap to the geometry. So if I want it to be right in the middle, I can snap to this. Then I can move and hold down shift while I perform this move and that's gonna lock it into that axis. So this way I can make sure that my alpha here I'm manipulating is snapped to the middle of the mesh. And then as I hold shift and move, I can just move along that one axis and position it where I want it. And this should now be symmetrical between the middle. So now that I have this going like this, I now want to generate this form and I want to have it cut out. So I want to trim it off. So I'm using this alpha as a trim process. And with this, what I want to do is I want to take that shape 
I want to generate it using Snapshot 3D. But then when I do this, the, just by clicking this button, it's going to generate it as a positive form. So if I click this here, you see I'm going to get this now, and it's generated over here. But you can see it's set to additive, or basically the union process. So it's just coming in as a new piece that's positive. Well, I don't want to have to come over here and select subtractive and do this every time. So instead of using that process, let me delete this guy quick, what I can do is if you hover over the snapshot button, you'll see at the very top of the screen it's going to have some more options. And there's a lot of things inside of ZBrush that will end up using modifiers like control and shift on your keyboard. So if you hover over the snapshot 3D button, you can see it says click to create a new subtool, which is what we did already for that other primitive made, that we made. Then click plus shift will append it to the current subtool. Click plus alt will make a new subtool but have it set to subtractive. And click plus shift plus alt will make a new subtool but set it to intersection. So what we want is the click plus alt option, which is going to generate this as a new subtool and then automatically set it to subtraction. So I have my alpha positioned. I come across the snapshot 3D, hold down the alt button, and then click. This is now going to create that new subtool over here, and you'll see it's automatically going to be set to subtraction. So what this means is if I get out of spotlight again by holding down Shift-Z, you can see that it generated this form here. And it should be good now. What are we doing here? And it ends up looking like this. All right. So I've got this weird tonal stuff happening. And it's set to subtractive, but it didn't cut through my shape. So once again, we must remember that whatever subtool we had selected, it's going to use that subtool's depth. So if I look at this subtool here and turn on solo, this is the depth. So I was looking at this way down from my model when I did that cut. So it's taking the subtool and it's using this range right here as the depth for the new tool that was made. Now the depth of this tool is higher than the depth of this tool. So it's floating above this right now. So when I have all these objects visible here, you can see it's not performing a cut because this tool used this subtool's depth and it didn't have enough depth to cut all the way through. So with this, now I can take this and use the Gizmo 3D. And I just need to modify this so it cuts all the way through my initial object. So I'm going to come over here with the Gizmo 3D. I'm going to click and drag down. And you can see what I'm doing is I'm moving this shape right here. And I'm moving it so it goes all the way through that other shape. Now if I turn off my polyframes, you can see now I have this. Now once again, this is all non-destructive, so I haven't made any modeling changes to the surface's mesh. I'm just taking subtools and applying them together to get what I want. So if I come back to this one and I find that this curve you know, is a little bit too you know, soft, I can just go back to that subtool, and then I can just manipulate that subtool. So to get this a little bit less soft, I can come through and just scale it, right? And this is going to change that shape, and it's going to change how it's manipulating on the object. So you can always come back in and modify stuff after you have it set up. And if you don't want it there, you can just go through and delete it as well. So let's get these, just got some questions here about some of this stuff. So I'm just going to hit these quick. So Mosin's asking, how do you make the final piece to a single sub object? So with that, there is an option that we're going to run into at the very end of this. And it's in the tool, subtool Boolean area. And there's a make Boolean mesh. And this will go through and it will process the Boolean uh, system here by hierarchy. So it's going to go from top to bottom. It's going to process that and then generate a result at the end. Um, if you watch the Z Classroom Live for using Booleans, which was Wednesday's class, um, you can definitely go and watch that and that will show you that exact process. We'll hit it at the very end of this after we're done uh, modeling this shape. Uh, to snap geometry, so if we go back into our spotlight here by hitting uh, shift Z and then hit Z again to act the wheel. So with the object, you can see that if I hover over an alpha, they have these little points and these will allow me to snap into different areas on the alpha. And this will also affect the geometry. So if I take my wheel here, you can see that if I hover over a mesh on my screen, I'm going to have those snap points too. So this is the mesh center of the current subtool I have selected. So I can see I can locate that. And then if I want to move this to where that mesh center is, I can just take this, scale this down a little bit, and reposition this. And as I come over here, it'll automatically snap 
to those ones. And so there's gonna be snap points set up for the subtool you have selected and snap points set up for the alpha you have selected. So that is how that snapping works. And you should have edges and mid edges and centers so you can snap to. Now, if you're in perspective, these may look a little bit weird because it's basically gonna be viewing your model with perspective. So you may have a center point here and then you may have like your midpoint on the left side also visible too. So if you're using the snapping, um, I recommend keeping perspective off. It's just gonna make a little clearer um, and not as confusing because you may get a whole bunch of dots, but they're correct. It's just that your model may be in perspective. Um, so just one thing there with the snapping. So the alt click to make a Boolean, we have a question on this from count quadrilla. <laughs> I like that name. Um, is it considered a macro? It's a hotkey. Um, I don't know if it's really, I wouldn't say it's a macro because you're not gonna be able to macro it in terms of a macro sense or a scripting sense. Uh, there's not really anything that could be macro or scripted with the snapshot uh, or with the spotlight wheel, but it's just a uh, combination key. So basically it's a modifier key applied to the button. So if you hover over the spotlight 3D icon and just hold down alt, that's going to give you that functionality. So it's an alt click. So more modifier uh, than macro. Uh, Pedro is asking, after creating the live boolean, the only way to smooth the edges is by Z remeshing. Uh, you can do that. There's also a little trick I'll show you guys uh, involving using the uh, crease option. There is a bevel functionality and the bevel functionality has another modifier hotkey uh, functionality of control that will allow you to bevel the edge of polygroups. So it will give you a nice kind of beveled edge on that. You can also use Dynamesh. Uh, but uh, Pedro, when I get into that uh, process in the stream, um, if you remind me uh, to show that, that would be excellent. I'm going to try to remember. <laughs> so, uh, but if I don't, yell at me and we'll, uh, we'll make, I'll show you guys how to do it. Uh, Sly Blake is asking if the depth of your first tool is at the angle with that effect. Uh, yes, it should. So definitely um, if you have your camera kind of shifted in a weird way when you generate it, um, it's going to do it based on like the screen space. Okay, so now I've gone through and I'm back to this shape here. So let's add some more parts here. So I'm going to hit Shift-Z to hide light box. And I'm just looking at this shape a little bit more. And this is my main modeling process if I'm using uh, the spotlight option here. So basically I'll take a model, I'll start subtracting some stuff. I'll find some areas that, eh, you know, I could use a little more detail here. So I'll say rotate, maybe like this. And I'll come through and let's, let's add some other little detail here. So I'm gonna go back and you can frame this wherever you want your screen. So I know that my spotlight uh, files are taking up a lot of this. So I'm gonna reposition my model over here a little bit. And then I'm gonna hit Z to bring everything back. And with this, I wanna move some of these away. So if, after you've started modeling with the spotlight here, you may have a mess. So this is, you know, you can see my mess, it's already started. Um, I can reorganize these. So on the spotlight wheel, we have a tile option. So we can tile proportional, tile unified, or a tile uh, selected. And so to use any of these, I can come over and first just select one. So I wanna select this object, and then I'm gonna click one of these here. So we'll do tile selected. This is going to go through and it's going to take all these and tile them and then give my selected one as the biggest one here. And then after you have this selected, I can then click off and scale these down and reposition. So you can always reorganize your spotlight assets if they start getting crazy. Um, another thing with the spotlight wheels, you have this whole Christmas in the corner over here. And this is going to come into play to modifying your spotlight stuff. So I'm going to take this object here and I'm going to put that in the center there and move it here. I'm going to snap to the middle point. I have this subtool selected. If I want to change this, I can select this one. And now I'm going to get the center point of that object. So you can always come over here and just change your subtool you have selected to modify where that center point is. Now with this object here, I want to make a circle part in here. So I'm going to bring this up, generate something like that. You know, some sort of detail. So not making this look as, you know, thick and blobby. So with this, I have it hanging off the edge here and I kind of want that to generate a cut shape. So I'm gonna hold down Alt again and click and this is gonna generate a new subtool as subtractive. Now, once again, when you generate this process, whatever subtool you have selected, the new subtool is gonna end up underneath it. So this one's gonna end up here and this will maybe generate uh, some unwanted results, especially if you have areas of positive stuff we're gonna add in here in a little bit. And you may not want, you know, one part to be subtracted from another part. So it's all based on hierarchy. So if you have a positive part and then a subtractive part, this part's going to subtract from this one. 
But then if I add another positive part and then a subtractive part, this subtractive part is going to hit this one, but it's not going to hit the other one. So it's a hierarchy based process. So you need to think of what ZBrush is doing when you're doing this process. So it's going to take this shape and subtract this, subtract this, subtract this. So just think of it as hierarchy based as you're doing this. So now once I've added this piece, I did that alt click down here on the snapshot 3d. It subtracted it out. I can hold shift Z to clear it. And now I have this going on. Then I can go back in and let's say now I want to modify the shape and maybe make it a little more detailed. So this is, we're going to talk about the Christmas in the corner over here. Now Christmas in the corner allows you to manipulate the different processes of this alpha. So you can modify these alphas after you bring them in. Now I have a tutorial on Z Classroom that's uh, all recorded and you can go watch. And with that tutorial, I open up a Lightbox file that contains like three shapes. And with those three shapes, I make an entire scene out of them. So I go through and manipulate just those shapes to give me new shapes. So as an example of this, with this image here, let's say I wanna put a border on it. So there's this option down here called frame. And if I just click and drag on this, it's gonna take that alpha and it's gonna generate a frame around it. And now it's giving me a new alpha. So this is what I had originally. And then I've came down here, clicked on the frame and dragged, and now I can generate a framed version of that alpha. And this will work on any alphas that you load in here. You can manipulate them this way. Now, the other options here, we have some flip options. We have some flip vertical and flip horizontals. We have an extend, which is pretty powerful because it's gonna take the alpha and it's gonna extend it wherever this crosshair is for the spotlight wheel. So I'm right directly in the middle of the model here and I perform an extend H, it's gonna extend this out horizontally. Now this is great for coming through and also reducing or removing parts of your alpha. So if I didn't want that tail coming out of the circle, I can come through and extend H in one direction and it's now gonna give me this, or I can make it wider and extend H in the other direction and it's gonna give me that. Now the position of these extends is gonna be based on where your crosshair is, as we just said. So if I come up and move this to say here, let me go back and lock it and then move and hold down shift. If I do it from here, this is the crosshair. So if I extend, it's now gonna give me this shape. So if I come over here and do extend vertical, now I'm gonna get this, right? And then I can cut it down. I can actually remove parts as well. So this is gonna go through and it's gonna end up modifying this alpha. And with this, you can take very simple alphas and then modify them to get entirely new shapes out of it. And so the extend is a good one for that. Now, in addition to the extend, we also have the tile options. And the tile options will allow you to create multiples of different pieces. So if you have a bunch of circles you need to create, you can tile those out and it's gonna take that alpha and duplicate it like that too. Now, let's, with this shape here, I'm gonna go back and just undo it to here. Let me get back to this. I wanna frame this again, but I wanna have it, you know, a little bit thinner. So I don't want the frame to be real thick, I want it to be thin. And then I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna reposition it so it snaps to the center of this one. Now this one is the subtool I just created, so it has a center. And this alpha should snap directly at the center of that thing. So now I'm gonna get this positioned directly where that other one is. And without the snapping, you wouldn't be able to do this. You'd have to kind of hand line it. But with this, I can take this alpha and move it back directly, since I have this subtool selected, and it should line up. Now with this, I can scale this up a little bit. And what I'm looking for here is I just want to make an offset. So I want a little bit of a ring around it. And then I want to extend this bottom part down here so it's a little bit wider. So I'm going to try doing the extend horizontal here and just move that out a little bit too. So now I have this ring that's going all the way around. Now that I have this ring and come over here and hold down Alt again, we're gonna do this as subtractive form two and click that. That's gonna now give me a new subtool over here. I can hold Shift Z and now you can see I've added that. So I've gone through and taken and added another element to it and subtracted it out. Now that looks a little bit weird, so I may wanna modify it some so I can move this down. And you can see as I'm moving this, I'm changing this Boolean operation in real time. So I'm taking the preview and I'm modifying it. And so this can allow me to get things, maybe happy accidents that you may have had one idea, but then when you start manipulating the form, it ends up turning into something else that may look a little better. <laughs> so oftentimes when I'm doing things, this is kind of the workflow. I'll make something be like, yeah, that doesn't look good. And then I'll go in and modify it and I'll get something a little bit better. So now with this, I want to add a positive form. So right now this area through here is cutting out and it's cutting all the way through. And so what this is happening is if this was a real piece, say like a metal bit that was CNC milled or cut out by a machine, 
that part would just fall out, right? There's nothing supporting it. So what I want to do is I want to add another piece of geometry that will live in this area here. So we're going to go back to Spotlight here. We're going to move this. Oops, make sure I got my Spotlight wheel on. Press Z. And let's say, let's go in here and grab something. So we're going to grab this guy. We're going to lock him there to position. And he's a pretty good thickness. I may want to make him a little bit bigger. So maybe like that. And now I want to do that extend because I want to have him fill this spot through here, right? I want to have that filled in. So I'm going to extend first to remove this middle part. So we're going to extend uh, horizontally here. And we're just going to shrink it. So just making a straight square rectangle. And then I'm going to extend this down a little bit. And then I'm going to extend it out again. And see now I'm getting more of that shape I'm looking for. So I just wanted a little piece of geometry about like that. And then I want to take this and I want to make sure it's snapped. I'm going to move it and hold down shift so it's axis aligned. So that looks pretty good there. I may want it to be a little bit thinner, so I'm going to extend the vertical again, just to make it a little bit smaller, so something like that. And now with this, what I want to do is I want to add this to my model. So I've been doing a lot of this subtraction process where I've been removing the elements, but I want to add this one to make it a solid piece. So with this, instead of clicking and holding Alt when I click Snapshot 3D, I'm just going to click Snapshot 3D. And it's going to take this and generate it as a positive. And so clicking that, now if I hit Shift Z, you can see I now have that part generated. And if I turn on Solo here, you can see it's a little bit long, right? So it's clipping a little bit too much. I kind of want a nice edge at the top and maybe at the bottom. So I'm going to come through and manipulate that part so it's still selected here. And I'm going to just scale that down. And now I'm getting this. And so now I have this connecting area between those two parts. So this part is no longer going to fall out if it was machined, right? And I still have some nice details that are coming through here, right? So I have this kind of tapered area through here. It's got this little bit of undercut. So it's giving some more interest to that shape. Now let's say with this part here, it maybe still be a little bit too thick. Maybe I would just want two bars, right? So instead of one big chunk, maybe I just want two. So I'm going to go to the Move option, and I'm going to scale this down to get it a little bit smaller, so something like that. And then I'm going to move it down to the bottom. I don't want to go all the way, so maybe there. Maybe lined up with that part. And now I want to add another one of these. And so what I can do is a few ways I can do this. First way is I come over here, and I can duplicate this. And this is going to give me a new subtool, and then I can now move that subtool where it is. But instead of doing that, I'm going to perform a duplication process using the Gizmo 3D. And so to explain this, I'm going to activate Solo here. And anytime you have the Gizmo 3D active and you have parts that are unmasked on your model, if you hold down the Control key and then use one of the Move options on the Gizmo 3D, this is going to take that unmasked part of your geometry and it's going to extrude or duplicate it. And this is just taking the geometry island now I have, which is that cube, and now as I hold control and move, I'm getting two of those. So this is handy if you have an object and you're like, hey, I want to duplicate it. it comes, we'll use a lot of this when we start getting some like cylindrical holes or pinholes into our uh, design here. We'll start using this a lot more. So I'm going to hold control and drag this out, and now I have two of these. If I'm doing this process where I hold control and drag, if I let go of control right now, this is a little bit high level, and I keep dragging, this is now going to look at the offset between that I just made, and then it's going to replicate that offset. So now I can just simply drag, and it's going to give me duplicated versions of that. Yep, so Pedro's got nailed it. So yeah, so I'm holding control, dragging, holding control, dragging. After I get the offset I want, release control, and keep dragging, and now I get duplicates. So another little thing there with using this control option with the Gizmo 3D to duplicate unmasked geometry. So now I have two of these here, and I can reposition one of them up. And so now I have a little airy nature happening there, so maybe some sort of design through there. So there we go with that. Now I can keep modifying this. So I really want some sort of cut like this through here. So I'm going to hit Z on my keyboard to bring back my spotlight mess here. And I'm going to go ahead and just tile everything and then move off to the side here and scale this down. Just reorganize my scene here. I'm going to go and I'm going to grab this one, move this out here, enlarge it a little bit, use this rotation option, hold down shift to lock that in. And I'm going to reposition this to the middle of this subtool, so there's the snapping point there. 
scale this up a little bit, and then I'm going to click and drag while holding shift to lock it into an axis. So it's going straight up the middle there. And then I want this as subtractive, so I'm gonna hold down Alt and click. And then I'm gonna hit Shift Z to see what that looks like. So this one went through and it cut, and this is a good example of the hierarchy system. So it came through and it's cut a subtractive form, and it's cutting out from these pieces that went above it. However, it's not cutting out from the pieces below. So as you can see here, it's not going through everything. And it was also using the, the Z depth of this tool here. So the cut option that I just made is the same depth as this one. So that's where it was getting that depth from. So to modify this, I need to first extend it out. So going back to that Gizmo 3D, you can hit this button right here to center to the um, mesh mask portion, portion of your mesh. So I've gone through and just went to the middle of this object and now I can extend that out and that's gonna now give me that cut. And now I can manipulate this further, may want it down a little bit lower. So some sort of design like that, maybe extend this out a little bit more. And then I'm not liking where this part is going anymore. So once again, anytime you do anything with this Boolean system, it's non-destructive. So I added that second bar there, but now this is looking a little bit weird, right? It's not looking what I want. So I can go back to that, activate the gizmo again and move it. And I can move it say down, I can make it a little bit smaller. I could even get rid of it entirely if I wanted. And now I got something like that. I'm gonna go modify this one again. I had a little clipping happening there with that part. So I have these little sharp edges. And so this is the main process for a lot of this. So it's going through, adding a part. If you don't like it, you can always change it. You can delete it, you can remove it. Um, and it's just manipulating the shapes and forms until you get what you want. So this cut through here, this one I added, was giving me that weird shape through here, but I didn't like the spikiness. So you see the spike right here. And that was caused by this shape that I made. Right, so it was hitting this edge too close to that there, so it was getting this spike. So I'm gonna move that, which is gonna soften that up. But now I have this other interesting shape that's happening down the bottom, right? So now I've cleaned that up, and now I have this happening, which is kinda cool. So now we got that. <clears throat> All right, hold on, let me get these questions and get some water here. So Jackson's asking, why is there no drag drop stroke in the mode for Snapshot 3 painting mode? Um, it's a good question, <laughs> not sure, <laughs> but there is not one. Uh, you can load in alphas into your spotlight scene pretty easy, so we'll cover that here in a second. Um, and I'll show the painting option you have also in spotlight. So we can create a blank alpha and then we can actually use a paintbrush to go through. But there is no drag drop stroke like you'd find with the other painting modes inside of ZBrush. So T. Garrity is asking if I create a, um, a model, but the orientation is off 90 degrees, is there a way to fix this? So let's say I have this shape here. Um, you can always manipulate these with the Gizmo 3D. So just come up here and go to move, scale, and rotate. After you have this activated, you can use the rotation options on this Gizmo. So here's a rotate X. If I found out that, hey, it was, I wanted it actually horizontally, not vertically, I just come over to the Gizmo 3D, I can click and drag, and this will form a rotation. And then as it's rotating, if I hold down shift, I'll be able to snap by default to five degree angles. And so I can snap to that 90 degrees. And then now I'm getting this, right? So you can always, the geometry that you have created can always be manipulated. And so you can definitely rotate it, you can definitely scale it, um, you can definitely move it around to get what you want. And then if it's, you know, you can always regenerate it too. So if you still have your model semi in the same location, um, you can add that light box uh, spotlight alpha back into the same spot and just recreate the mesh. Thank you, Claire Studio, I appreciate it. So Jackson is asking about drawing polygroups. Uh, so you can use it with masking, but there is no way just to directly uh, draw polygroups. So with Bob Yaw is asking, is there a difference between move, scale, and rotate if the Gizmo 3D is active? So not with the Gizmo 3D. So when you come through and click this, these are always gonna give you the same 
manipulator. So basically the Gizmo 3D is a universal manipulator. Um, there is a plugin that you can download that will allow you to uh, use uh, the move, scale, and rotate, and as you switch through them, it will limit what the Gizmo 3D displays. So this is a plugin that's available on the Resource Center. So if you just do a search for Pixelogic Resource Center, there's going to be a link to download plugins, and one in there is called the man. What do I call it? Gizmo something. <laughs> it has it has some weird weird name, um, but that will allow you to. And if you install that, it will allow you when you select move, scale, or rotate. If you have move selected, you'll just get the move options on the Gizmo 3D. If you select scale, you're just gonna get the scale options. And if you select rotate, you'll just get the rotate options. Um, the other thing with the Gizmo 3D, um, if you switch it off, you can toggle to the transpose line. And when you're in the transpose line, which looks like this, these will make a difference. So if you're in move, scale, or rotate, and you have the transpose line visible, the transpose line will do different things. So that is the uh, why the move, scale, and rotate exist up here, because the Gizmo 3D came after, but the transpose line was first. And so the Gizmo 3D just came later on and it's just overwritten those. But when you're in the Gizmo 3D, it's universal. Uh, Saeed, what's your question about the alphas in low resolution? Uh, Savage King is asking the correct way to make a low poly model once you're done with the shape. So you can basically use Z Remesher. So we take this, generate a Boolean option out of it, which is going to take what we hear, see in preview and generate new geometry. And then with this process, you're getting these uh, polygroups created. So basically every shape is giving you these polygroups, which is basically uh, geometry coloring or selection set type uh, meshes. And with these, you can then use those. And we have an algorithm uh, called Z Remesher that will go through and look at those, try to hold those edges and give you new topology in between those areas. So that's one way you can make a low polygon mesh out of it. Uh, so Saeed, for the realistic alphas in low resolution, the resolution is definitely going to generate uh, what kind of topology you're going to get out of snapshot. So if your alpha is really, really low, you're not going to get a very good clean result. So you want to make sure you at least have an alpha that's 512, I think is what the uh, majority of these are. So at least have your alpha at 512. And these alphas can be generated in any application. And the main thing with these is that they need to be a 16-bit gray file. So all these here were PSDs that were saved out in 16-bit gray. Um, you can make alphas inside of ZBrush pretty easy. So one example of how to do this is let's say I want to take this shape and make an alpha out of it, right? So I can position it on my screen and go to alpha and I can do uh, transfer and there's a grab doc option here which will grab what you see if you just have a mesh so say i come over here and let's uh let's see what i got here take this star and so if i process that model with the boolean i could get a result and then if i have that as just a single sub tool so like i see here i can go to alpha and we can do a, a from mesh option right here so alpha from mesh and this is going to give you this little window i can't move this unfortunately i can move my and in here, you'll be able to manipulate this to change your angle, move it around. And this is going to give you an alpha right there. So as an example of this, let's say I made this star, okay? And I'm going to take this. There's a map size slider down here that you can't see. Um, so I have that set to 512, which is going to give me 512 pixels on top of top, 512 pixels down the sides. So I'm going to hit OK to that. And this is now going to give me a new alpha. Now to import an alpha into your uh, spotlight session, it's very easy. Uh, you can import external alphas by coming up here to alpha and going to import. After you have that alpha loaded in, or like the one here where I could created it inside of ZBrush, you now just need to click this add to spotlight button. And it's going to add it either if you have, don't have a spotlight file over, it's going to make a new spotlight file for you. If you have a spotlight file that already exists, it's just going to append it to it. So if I click this option here, you see now I'm going to have that star loaded into the rest of my alphas. Now you'll notice with this star that, let me switch back to this tool here, that the star has these gradient values coming off of it, right? So it's not fully black and white. So it's not a one to zero image, but it has some gradient values. So this is okay. You can load these in to Spotlight. Now, one thing to remember about this is that the snapshot 3D function is gonna take whatever alpha you loaded in and it's gonna clamp it down. So it's gonna take this version here that may have you know, 256 uh, variables of gray from going from uh, zero to 256. And it's going to clamp it down so it's one and zero, and then it's going to give you the result of that. So as an example of this, if I do snapshot 3D, I'm not going to get the gradients out of here, right? It's just going to give me this shape. 
So if I go to solo, turn off my spotlight, this is what I'm getting. So I fed it this, but it's only going to take what you have here and it's gonna clamp it down to one and zero. It's only gonna give you a shape generated from the mesh from a black and white. So you can feed it an image that has more information, but this is what you're gonna get out of it. And so that's the result I'm gonna get out of there. So I'm not getting any gradient ramps through here. Now, if you want that alpha to be processed in a 3D format, what you can do is you can go to the alpha palette and then you can come down here to the make 3D option here. In here, you have some sliders here, some resolution sliders. These are gonna be relate very closely to what the DynaMesh resolution sliders do. And then in here, you can determine if you want it double-sided, if you wanna smooth this at all. And then when you click make 3D, it's gonna take that alpha and then that is now gonna generate geometry from that alpha. And this process here will respect that depth. So if I click make 3D on this, you can see this is what I'm getting out of it. So it's making that star and you can see it does have that height information. Now the resolution or the detail on this are gonna be determined by these sliders here. So if these are increased, you're gonna get a better result out of it. So that is if you wanna generate a shape from an alpha and you want it to have that depth information. But if you do it from spotlight, it's always gonna clamp it down. Now with the spotlight option as well, you can also just import texture files too. So they don't have to, the ones that are gonna work the best are 16 bit grays. So that's what these are here. Um, but if you come up here to say texture, actually let me hit come on my keyboard here, go in the light box and we go to the texture area in here. And in here I have some uh, alpha plants I've made. Let's load these in here. And these are PSDs that just have their background knocked out. They could be anything. Um, and they're pretty high resolution. So I'm just gonna select these leaf, leaf one here and load that in. And where'd you go, leaf? Let's try that again. There we go. If you have Lightbox or Spotlight open, it's gonna automatically process it. So you can see it just popped it right in here. And now I have this leaf shape, right? So this leaf shape has color, right? This isn't a 16 big gray alpha, it's just a colored image. And now with this, if I put that on my model here and let's process that with Snapshot 3D, you're gonna see this is what it's gonna give me. Okay, so once again, it's taking the depth of the model I had selected and it's taking that texture or that image and it's isolating it down to that one and zero. So basically if it's color, it's gonna make it grayscale and then it's gonna clamp it down till it's one and zero. Any areas that fall in on or off are gonna end up being generated as mesh or not mesh and then this is what you get. So you can use that to create some you know, interesting shapes as well. Um, so this one's a pretty interesting shape here. And then if I set this to subtractive and turn everything back, let me see if I can get this to give me what I want here. Wait for it. Put it down here. Get rid of that star. So now you can see I can start cutting leaves out of my stuff now. Um, so not what you probably want, but as an example, you can kind of get this stuff out of it. And that's just taking that alpha and cutting it in. And then I'm just manipulating around and you can get that result too. But so you can load textures into it and use textures with Snapshot 3D that are you know multicolor and then grayscale alphas are gonna be your best, but it's always gonna clamp it down to one and zero. Um, and then if your alpha is really low resolution, you're definitely gonna get blurry natures out of it. So it's still gonna do that clamp down but it's, you may not get the fidelity that you want out of it. Um, also the size when you generate it is also gonna come into play too. So if I come back and let's select this one and go back in the light box here. We really got a, a light box mess here now. So let's move these and then let's re-angle these. Oops. Let's go and select this guy and generate, okay. So this one's a good example of um, using the uh, different functionalities of stuff too. So let's grab this one. So this is a good custom one because it shows a good example of you know, just the quality you can get out of this snapshot process too. So with this, you just, I just made this alpha. Um, I think I used an Affinity Designer for it. I just came through, made some lines, uh, had it where it girded out nice, and then I just exported it out as a grayscale PSD. And then with this, I just loaded it into ZBrush here. And if I take this, I can now, you know, put it over here, snap it to my 3D model and add the geometry on this. And if I see if I get out of there, this is the result I'm getting, right? So it's just taking it 
and made it like that. Um, one question asking if it worked with Illustrator style file vector shapes. It will not do anything with vectors, so you will have to turn them into an image, a rasterized image, and then export that out. We do have a plugin called uh, Text3D and Vector Shapes, which lives in the Z plugin palette here. And in here, you can load in SVG files, and then it will generate geometry from those. So if you have vector files that are paths um, that basically have different things, I'd say try using them with the uh, Text3D and Vector Shapes option here, and that will end up generating a uh, mesh for you as well. And once they're generated as an SVG, you have some other options. You can control the extrusion with this plugin here, the spacing of it. You can have some beveling to it and up and down the resolution too. But this will allow you to load in SVGs or vectors. But for the spotlight process, it's only going to be um, rasterized images. But you see this one's a pretty good example of you know, just what you can do with just a simple alpha. And then after you have this, you know, now I can start modifying this. So I'm gonna copy this tool. Actually, I'm gonna clone that part. Now, if you click clone up here, it's going to take whatever sub tool you have selected and generate a new tool file. So I've just now cleaned my scene. So I had that one that I was building, but now just as a demonstration, I'm just gonna take this one. And then let's say with this one, I wanna make something, you know, maybe I wanna make this little airy through here. Like say I was doing some sort of uh, weapon rail or handguard. I can come through and add some parts. So I'm gonna go back into my spotlight here, scale this down a little bit, move that over. I'm gonna grab another shape, like say this one here. I'm gonna snap it to the middle of the mesh there, snap it to the thing like so, scale this up until I get it to about there. Now with this one, I'm gonna take this and make sure it's in the middle, holding down shift, locking that in. And I want it to start here. And then with this, I'm gonna hold down alt and click on that snapshot 3D going to generate a subtractive shape. And then if I get out of this and turn on solo, turn off solo, you'll see now I have this, right? So it's cutting through. So now I'm getting this crazy advanced metal shape. And all I've done is applied to alphas. So I had my original alpha, which looked like this, and I've now added a second one. Now I can do that duplication process again. Um, also as count uh, quadrilize saying we can also use a ray mesh. Uh, I'm not going to go through the uh, ray mesh process because that's a little bit high for uh, initial ZBrush usage, but doing the duplication process of holding control, dragging with the Gizmo 3D, finding the spaces, spacing I want, then releasing control and continuing dragging and go all the way down. And now I've got that. So now I've got this mesh part through here that's being generated. Now, if this is a little bit too much in here, I can always modify this too. So going back to that subtool, I'm gonna activate solo. So that's the only thing I see. And now in here, you can see I have multiple parts. And if I want to do this, um, like maybe I want to remove one of these. So I'm gonna show you the guys, the process, guys and gals process to do this too. So for this, I want to isolate some of these parts out. And to do this, I'm gonna establish some poly grouping across the surfaces here so that every single one of these can be selected individually. Uh, right now, if I turn on my poly frames and turn off line, you can see they're all the same color, so mostly. The front paces are all the same color and then they have a middle color going through. So instead of this, I wanna get these all as a different color or a different poly group. So I'm gonna to go to the tool palettes. I'm gonna go down to the poly groups area here and I'm gonna click auto groups. This is gonna go through and it's gonna look at all the geometry islands. So a geometry island is a piece of topology that is isolated by itself. So this right here is an island. So nothing is connected to it. This one's an island, this one's an island, this one's an island and all the way down. So if I click this auto groups, it's going to look at all those and then give me a new poly group for each. So clicking auto groups there, you'll see now I get this rainbow effect down the thing there. And now that I have these poly groups, I can use these as basically as like selection sets. So I can use these to isolate these different parts individually. And to do this, I can use a brush called the select rectangle brush, which is accessed by holding down control and shift on your keyboard. And that'll give you the select rectangle brush. Now with this brush, if you'll control and shift and click on one of these, it's going to isolate first. So it's just going to show that part and it's gonna hide everything else. Now, if I hold control and shift again and then click, this will now hide the part and then show everything back. So I just hid that. So this little process is, could be a little confusing as well, especially <laughs> first using ZBrush. We've gone down a, a tangent road of complexity pretty quick. But basically we applied some poly groups based on islands and then now we've used the select rectangle brush. We're going to isolate by first control shift click, and then we're gonna hide control shift click, and then now we can remove other pieces as well. So maybe I wanna remove that many. Now if I get out of solo 
and turn off my polyframes there, you can see now I have this. So now I've just hidden those parts of the geometry there. Now I can keep playing with this. I can bring these back. They haven't gone away. They're just hidden. So if I hold control and shift and click off, everything's going to come back. Uh, control Z and go back to where I was. But right now they're still there. So if I want to get rid of them 100%, I'm going to go to the tool palette, sub tool area, oh, tool palette, geometry area. And then we're going to go to modify topology. And then in here, I'm going to do delete hidden, and that's going to remove those hidden parts. So if you ever hide anything, and you want to fully get rid of it. That's where that's located. So now I have this effect happening. And now I can continue, you know, modifying this one. So let's go back into spotlight here. Let's say I want to add, hmm, what this, this shape's a fun one. And maybe I don't want to add it at this angle because I don't really know what I'd do with it there. So let's get out of spotlight, shift Z. Let's rotate to this side, shift Z to bring this back, Z to open up my spotlight wheel there, I'm gonna snap. And I'm going to make sure that's selected. We'll bring back all that other craziness soon. And then I want to add maybe some details down here. So I'm going to position this one here, hold down Alt and click. It's going to go through and add that as subtractive element. Now I could do that same control process again where I come through and, um, there we go, I got to have it selected. Where I come through and uh, do that duplication. I could also just do it in here so I can hold alt and click, and then I can move my alpha, right? Position it here, alt click, position here, alt click. Now, if I wanted to go to the same sub tool, as I'm holding alt, I can also hold down shift, and that will should now uh, lock it in. But I did something weird. <laughs> oh, I said it as an intersection. So there you go. But you can see that's how you can come through and start making these really crazy complex shapes. So if you wanna make some girders, it's very easy. Um, if you want to make weapon parts, very easy. So all I'm doing is adding shapes to this. Um, so what's going to go into next? The um, if you're happy with your light box, so if I bring everything back here, go back to this, select one of these. So if you like what you have made or created in Lightbox as well, maybe you've modified some of these alphas, and you want to save this out. If you come up here to this top of the texture area and there's a load and save spotlight, um, you can come up here and save this. And then if you reload this, all your alphas are going to be loaded back in uh, where they are. So if you find something, if you've modified an alpha where you like it, um, you can definitely save that out. So <clears throat> we have a question. Is there a ruler to measure shapes in spotlight so you don't have to switch to the transpose tool? There is no way to measure uh, objects inside of uh, spotlight. Um, you could have a tool that you have in your scene that is a ruler or has some sort of measurement to it, and then you can have that visible while you're using Spotlight, but there's no way to uh, particularly measure uh, anything inside of Spotlight. Uh, Mickey Mike is asking how you do a rope alpha texture. So that I'd probably end up modeling the rope and then grabbing it. Um, if you do a search for um, Ask ZBrush making a rope, um, I go through the process. There's videos on YouTube where I start from nothing and walk you through the steps to get a rope. And then for the rope um, process there, after it's created, then you just use that alpha grab doc to generate that alpha from it, or rather even the alpha from mesh process would probably be better. And then you could align it and generate that alpha texture. Um, but with that uh, video for Ask ZBrush 2 on making a rope, I turn it into a brush. Um, and then you can actually drag it out as a rope and use it that way too. So you don't have to use it as an alpha texture and apply it. You can actually make the rope and then drag it around your character. Uh, West 3D, the text and vector, text 3D and vector shapes plugin will work with uh, shape files. I think I already answered that. Uh, SB Mongoose is asking, is there any place you'd recommend for grabbing geometric alphas? So mostly creating your own is probably the way to do it. I mean, any alphas are going to work. So if you can find, you know, just Google search alphas. Uh, sometimes people have vector shape packs you can download, and then you can load those into, say, Illustrator um, and save those out as uh, PSDs. Um, most of the ones that I make are all just primitive shapes. I'll use the Z Modeler brush and make them. Uh, I use a lot of uh, Affinity Designer uh, is my go-to recently over Illustrator. Um, it's a little bit simpler for me um, to go through and make alpha parts. Uh, so I use that really quick and then I have a few that I can make and then 
just duplicate around. So a lot of the things, especially all these, you know, they're very simplistic shapes. We're looking at, you know, basically the triangles with parts cut off. These have certain just angle bends happening on it. So it's, you don't need a lot of complex stuff. Um, you can definitely go as complex as you want. Like I have some um, other examples here, like things like this. So definitely for like webbing modeling, like you can make something like this and then I can load this into my uh, spotlight file here. And then with this, if I just take this, I can reposition it wherever I want in my scene here and then generate that right in. And now I've taken it and just generated that shape. So you can definitely do a lot with it. Um, but just remember, it's always gonna end up uh, giving basically like a projection modifier. So it's, it's taking that alpha and generating a 3D shape out of it, but it's gonna do it where it's taking that shape and shooting geometry through. So one thing if you're doing say like weapons like this, you can see how this edge is always going to be harsh. So you're not gonna end up with a smooth taper through there automatically. Now what, I, what you can do is you can definitely realign that shape like this, go back into spotlight here and take something that has a taper, like one of these shapes here. That's what a lot of these with the indents is what I was using them for, um, to basically you know determine beveled edges for different parts. So now if I take this and rotate it and then scale this up, I can position it here and I can snap to that end there. And now I can generate this by holding Alt and clicking and I'll make that subtractive form. And now I've taken that and now I've got a little nicer edge on the back. So this is what it looked like without it. Right, and then I've just added another part and given it a little more form. So you can definitely come back in and hit all those shapes to get little tapers out of stuff. And then once again, you can control where this is by just moving it around because this is all in preview there. Pedro's has some, uh, some ideas for where to get good decals and alphas. So Jamba Web's asking about live boolean with a chamfer, fillet, or radius result. So basically with anything uh, using the live boolean system, it's going to give you just what you see, right? So what you see in preview is what you're gonna get. Now, one thing that I wanna hit on here is there is a hidden option that lives in the crease menu uh, to kind of blur some stuff out. So let's see, let me load in, let's quick save this. Uh, if you're in ZBrush and you want to save, Say, as a first time user, always hit this quick save button. It's gonna be a lot easier um, than doing a lot of other stuff. And then your quick saves are gonna be stored in here. So there's my project right there. So we're gonna go in and I have some examples here of some weapons. So let's go in here and do this. As this loading in. Wait for it. This one's a little bit big. All right, so here's, here's what that shape ended up looking like. <laughs> so this is all the, um, the process here where I went through and I just started adding shapes. And this is all using that same spotlight file. So this is the exact same process um, through here. This is the final results. This is the one that was processed with the Boolean. Uh, one thing if you're using this process, these meshes can get pretty heavy pretty quick because just the amount of topology you're throwing at it, right? So if you take an alpha and it's a big alpha and it has like, you have like a 512 resolution alpha coming in, you're basically getting a block of geometry for every pixel. So that's a pretty dense mesh. And then if you do that density on something very tiny, like these little holes right through here, these holes are very expensive. <laughs> They're very expensive cylinders in this mesh. Um, so I'll show you the, the creation file here. But so these holes here, really uh, would end up start generating uh, a lot of topology and tax on your system just because I wanted them to be round and I generated them with an alpha and the alpha was pretty large and then I generated them really small. So all of these had basically, you know, a lot of density on the top and a lot of density on the bottom and then a lot of long edges going through. And then of course I took them and multiplied them, you know, all over the place. So that those little holes there were, were a lot of topology. So just be cautious when you make little holes. I'd say do them at the end. <laughs> you can definitely do them, but they, it will end up uh, making your mesh heavy. So here is the, uh, oh, where's the right one? This one. Oh, not that one. Not that one. This one. So this is the example here uh, with the, like, the box process. So I'm just going to go through and click these really quick so you can kind of see what was going on here. So here I have that cube we started out with. 
right? And then I went through and I subtracted this shape. And then I came through and added that little taper. And then we added this element. So this is where I went with this one uh, during that stage. This is that same circle shape with that little end. And I just positioned it so it's cutting through everything and it was giving me this nice result. Then I added this as a solid, and this one actually stuck out through the back. Then I cut that top out there. Then we started going crazy with some holes, right? And then I added more holes. And then we started adding some tapers. So these are just moving different parts and subtracting them out. So some little details here. Here we went through and I generated more holes, but I did them as like an offset function. So instead of going all the way through, it's giving this uh, little indented edge there. And I added some more elements to the side. And you can see as I'm adding these booleans here, you can see how it's, it's taxing a little bit more just because of all the geometry I'm throwing out. So this whole thing here um, with booleans in the live preview mode, uh, some of these pieces were uh, pretty heavy. And so yeah, as I just came through and started adding more micro details on here, and these are just different light box files or just different spotlight alphas that I modified and then just kept adding. And then the final result was this. And then after I was done with this, I went all the way back up to the top. And then in here, I did the make Boolean mesh. Uh, this one takes a little bit to process here for the thing. So I don't want to really want to waste your guys uh, time here doing it, but it processed it and then it gave me uh, this as my result. And so that was my final Boolean there. Um, some other examples of what you can do with this. So here is a robot. So these were, we saw the um, images of the camera bot that was moving. So we had folders and cameras. These are some of my starting experiments uh, for those uh, meshes. So this one here was one. And this was all created with Lightbox 2. Uh, and you see, he's got a lot of expensive holes too. So that little element's really nice to add to things, but it's definitely uh, costly. Then we've got um, another part. So same process here. And this is just kind of the things you can get out of it. Now for this area uh, through here, what I did was I made this one shape and then I converted it. So I made it a Boolean object and then I grabbed the alpha from it. So as an example, if I go back to this one here, this is all one shape, right? And so I just converted so it's geometry and then I went to alpha and I did that from mesh process. And this opens up this window here and now I can take this shape and generate an alpha from it, right? And so I can frame this, maybe zoom out a little bit, and then I can generate that alpha. And then once at this alpha is created, now I can load this back into uh, my spotlight scene. So let me see, let's go up here, go to my alpha and go to spotlight. And so now I have this in my spotlight scene. And then now I can take this object and I, what I did was just shrunk it down a little bit just so it went inside. And then I used the Christmas in the corner down here to extend the vertical down a little bit. So basically I'm just looking at it and making sure it falls into the uh, depth of my shape. Oops. And then after that was positioned, I then did it as a uh, snapshot element. And so it gave me a new piece. And then that is how I kind of cut through that part there. And so this gives you some pretty cool stuff because if you're, if I didn't have all those circles cut in, you can see how I can start getting thin pieces of metal out of this, right? And then I could control this to get even different results. So now I have like a little finite uh, metal, lighten it up a little bit. So it's fun to play with, um, just taking shapes and then generating alphas out of stuff you've shaped and then getting the result. So fun stuff there. And then I can pull this back. There you go. Now I got it looking like it was molded out. So that was just taking the paste you've already made, making an alpha out of it, and then using that alpha to cut into the surface again. Uh, another example is, yes, that's what this one was. And you can get like these shapes, if you're ever doing like rails for uh, machine guns or stuff, it's, it's very easy. Like we're talking about taking a square, I'm moving, cutting this part out, cutting this part out, cutting these out, and then you're done. <laughs> so it's, it's really like four alphas to get that shape. And if you tried to model it, it would take you a lot longer, but for simplistic like um, Picatinny rails, uh, it's very easy using this process. And then this is uh, just another example where stuff can go really crazy real quick. So a bunch of different parts, um, and you can put them together and you can start to see like 
So just taking these elements, these were those rails, basically the ones we just did. You can see I've used that subtractive element there. Uh, this is all just uh, the live Boolean processed right now. So these are just, there's no Dynamesh on this at all. And so you can see I have these guys, and I can highlight them. Where are they at? This one here. So there's some rail elements that were done really quick. And if I turn on my polyframes and lines, um, you can see they're mostly, a lot of topology's been flooded through them. But that's all just Boolean results there. So for the uh, one question we had on the creasing option that I wanted to show, let's go through and I'm just gonna do this process really quick. So I'm gonna take a cylinder and I'm make it a poly mesh here. And then with this, I'm going to, let's see what I'm gonna do here. Let me think, let me think. Um, no, we'll use spotlight. All right, so. I'm gonna load in this file here. Grab this one, move this out of the way. I take this and center it. So make sure my light box is centered, or my spotlight wheel is centered on the alpha. Big it up a little bit. And I'm gonna center that on my cylinder here. And I'm gonna generate geometry from it. So now I have, oh, where are you at? There we go. This shape. All right. so. Let's say you've gone through, this process can be done with uh, Boolean objects and be done with, it works really well with the uh, spotlight objects because spotlight, as we talked about initially, is generating geometry here, generating geometry here, and then all it's doing is connecting the points from this end to this end and giving you like a single line through all this. So there's no divisions through here. So with this process, if I have any shape that's um, more convex than concave, um, this crease process is gonna work awesome. And so what this is going to do is, if I go here and go down to the geometry area, there's a crease area. And in this crease area, you have the option uh, directly below this, there's this bevel width. And so what this bevel width slider does, um, it's gonna try to bevel the um, edges of the geometry. And with this, it usually tries to bevel around polygroups. There's a hidden feature with this slider that will allow you to take these polygroups and it's going to rip them apart basically and then generate new topology between them, giving you a nice bevel. So this is only really gonna work with objects that are more uh, convex. So it's not gonna work with stuff like this, like concave stuff, because if you think about it, we have two surfaces, this is surface A and surface B. And if they're like this, when it goes to rip the uh, polygons off, it's gonna rip like this. Right? And that's gonna generate extruded geometry from that rip to the initial shape. However, these are now gonna cross. So you're gonna end up with you know, cross geometry in here. But if you have a, <laughs> a, a concave shape, when these faces go out, you now have spacing. So you're not getting that interlaced topology through there. So this process works best with shapes that are convex, not concave. So to use this, we just need to locate the bevel width slider. This lives in the tool geometry crease bevel width slider here. And then now if you hold down control and click the slider, this will perform this bevel width. And so as you can see, as I'm processing this, it's now beveling my shape, right? So it's ripping off the polygroups between the two. And now I'm getting this soft beveled edge, right? So this is what I had before. Hold down control, go to the bevel width slider, click and drag while holding control. This is going to look at those polygroups and then it's going to apply a bevel between them. So there we go. So that is the bevel width little crease option there. That's a little trickery uh, that's located in the crease area. So I'm look at these questions here quick. Uh, Bobby is asking, is it possible to select or hide a single polygon using the select lasso? I can select poly loops, but not polygons for some reason. So the select lasso, it's uh, one of the benefits of select lasso is that it allows you to select those loops, right? So the, the hardest thing is if you hold, have select lasso um, selected and you hold control and shift and click on a loop, it's gonna default to that loop. You can get it to work like select rectangle if you hold control and shift and then click on a point but if you click on an edge, it's gonna give you a loop. And that's kind of the bonus for select lasso. Um, if you wanna hide uh, just polygons for select lasso, the main thing you wanna remember is that you need to select all the points in the poly group. Um, basically, well, one of the points out of the four. So if I have select rectangle, you see I'm gonna be able to isolate 
like this. And if I have select lasso, holding control and shift and clicking over here will allow you to use different selection brushes. And lasso will give you this functionality and then you can hide by that. And so if you just wanna select and hide one polygon, um, you're gonna have to play around with that kind of system, right? So you basically, if I want just this polygon visible, you know, first I need to make sure that it is visible, right? And then you say I have all these on the back. I know I wanna hide this one because I just want this face. So I'm gonna hold Alt and that's gonna remove that. And then I can hold Alt and remove that. And now I just have one polygon. Um, but that's gonna be the, the main thing there. And then the lasso is always gonna to default to that edge loop one uh, if you end up having it selected. So as an example here, if I hold Control and Shift with the lasso and I click here, you see it's gonna remove that edge loop. If I hold and select that same process, do select rectangle, it's not gonna do anything, right? So the benefit of the lasso is that it will allow you to do those lassoed groups. But you can get it to work too if you just select a point, but if you select an edge, it's always gonna go through and hide that edge loop if it exists. So let me know if that makes sense or answers that question. All right, I gotta scroll now. You guys, you guys have flooded some question here. Thank you, Dr. Despresso. Yes, so yes, try hiding the verts. Uh, yes, there is a trial. So this, the trial of 2020 is out and you can go through and use that. Yes, this is the real myself. <laughs> uh, Spotlight will use any image file. So you can import those in. So this was a question from uh, Brian here. So if you can use alphas, so I can go to the alpha here. Uh, for any alphas inside ZBrush, what you need to, should be using for an alpha is a uh, image that has is grayscale and has a depth of 16 bit. So you can see as I hover over this, it's an alpha, it's 256 by 256 and its depth is 16 bit. Uh, PSDs are primarily what I end up using for alphas. So I'll just save them as PSDs and load them in. Uh, texture files can go over here. These can also be used with um, Spotlight. So initially when Spotlight was created, it was and used for say texturing an object. So taking color and then applying it this texture on your model as poly paint. So you could transfer from the texture to your model through that vertex coloring. And so any image format work on this um, color wise. Um, but if you wanted to go to the alpha palette route, it's gonna be a 16 bit grayscale alpha. And then file formats, whatever file format. Uh, so PSD is usually what I go for that. Uh, Jama Web, you're asking about each of the booleans has a sharp object. How do you add a radius? So I don't know if this option here with the bevel kind of displayed that functionality for you. Let me know. I'm catching up on questions. Uh, the okay, so T. Garrity is asking in the boolean option here. So the make boolean mesh. There's this DSDIV. So what this DSDIV, and also if you have uh, any option, you don't really know what it is in ZBrush. If you hover over top of it and then hold down the control key, let me get my, my menu back here. Um, this is going to pop this up and it'll give you some information on it. So this is gonna tell you exactly what the dynamic subdivision button does. Uh, so basically if this is on, it's going to process any subtools you have that are using dynamic subdivision. And so it's gonna take these and it's gonna look, if they have dynamic subdivision on, it's going to apply that dynamic subdivision and then process. If this is turned off, it's gonna turn off the dynamic subdivision first, then process. So basically if you have dynamic subdivision objects, keep this on when you use the Boolean or you're gonna get the low resolution result of it. But if any button you have inside ZBrush you wanna find more about it, just hold down control. And there's usually some auto notes that exist on all these, most of these buttons, I think there's some that may be missing some, but they will give you more information on that. And additionally, you can also go to the help option here and search online docs. Uh, still reading these questions here. Uh, Count Quadula. So John Carter's asking, would zero measure make something game ready from this? Uh, so most, most of the stuff, zero measure is a, 
an instant one click solution for a lot of stuff. Um, and the thing with zero mesher is it just depends on what your quality level you want out of it. So if you hand topologize something, you're probably gonna get exactly what you want out of it, but it's also gonna take you a lot of time. And zero mesher is giving you topology in a click. So if you're doing animation, you're probably gonna want, you know, polygons in certain areas on a model, right? So if you have an elbow, you're gonna want some loops going like this. You may want them going, if it's really low, you're gonna want those triangles exactly where you want them. Uh, Zero Mesh is gonna give you a low res mesh, but it, it's probably not gonna give you the exact topology in that area that you want. So you can, what I do with um, stuff like that is I'll use Zero Mesh to get a initial pass of topology. And then I can go through and edit that topology using say an appended Z-sphere um, and go through or even taking that mesh and ripping it apart with say the Z modeler brush. And then I can go in and fix those areas that zero mesher uh, wasn't perfect on. But the time zero mesher saves is huge because it only takes a second, right? And if you're doing a static mesh, um, definitely uh, zero mesher is gonna give you um, pretty much all, mostly probably what you want. So let's see what zero mesher does with this one. Um, this one should be pretty good. So here as an example, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna run zero mesher. With this, what I'm looking at here is the topology. So I have these polygroups set up and they have nice borders to them. So I wanna make sure I keep groups on with zero mesher. And then once again, if I hand topologize this, it'd take me a while, right? But zero mesher will give me a result in a few seconds, which is actually the power, you know, it's the biggest thing. So it doesn't hurt to try it, you know, just click the button, see what it gives you. If it's what you want, then you're done. Right? If not, then you can go through and uh, manually topologize stuff. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Yeah, so that's, that was the initial zero mesh result there. So as a low res version of its high self, it, you're pretty good. Now, could you come through and say, you know, model this better by hand? Yeah, but it's just up to you. So you can also run zero mesher multiple times, um, which also helps. There's this half button here, and this will allow you to get lower versions, and sometimes you'll get better results the more you run this. That was not a good result there. Um, but definitely just play with it is what it is. And if um, sometimes it will give you almost exactly what you want, and you won't have to do anything. So there's the last one I did for the Boolean process where I ran a model through it and zero meshed it. <laughs> the topology was perfect. Um, and so at that point, for that ring, you just crease some edges and you're done. So it's just trial and error, see what works. But it's, a sim it's simple to test and it doesn't take long to see if it gives you a good result. So for the rounded stuff, so if you have that object created and let's go back to here, um, and let's say I want this rounded now, this is a little bit heavy still, but you can definitely do it. Um, so what I, for this, let's say I want to round that edge. Right now when I did that crease, and then I did that bevel by holding control and dragging out and basically took the polygraph and split it. This topology is the same as what we were kind of getting with the, um, the spotlight functionality. So I have a point here, a point here, and nothing in the middle, right? This is all just a single line connecting those points. So at this stage, I could go and say, select the Z modeler brush, and I could hover over one of these edges, and then I go in here and I could do say, hey, let's do, oh, let's get an edge. If you ever have trouble selecting stuff with the Z modeler brush, you can definitely open it up and there's a do nothing option. And you can turn that on for different ones. And then now I'll do multi edge loops and then there's an interactive elevation. And so I can come across and insert edge loops on this. Now this is a lot of topology, so it's gonna be a little bit slow here as I do this. But you can see now I've just came through and added a bunch of edge loops in there. And now it's gone through and added topology and given me a, a, a rounded edge um, versus that harsh one. So you see that there. So you can definitely uh, do something like that, but it's depending on the amount of topology of your mesh, like this is pretty heavy. Like we're at 167 points um, on the mesh here. So doing anything like that to get that kind of bevel um, may be a little taxing on your system. I'm running a, uh, on a laptop here, so it's a little bit taxing. Uh, Pedro's asking, does the bevel respect masking or visibility? No, it's gonna do everything. So it's gonna be global. I don't know, I can't tell you if it actually does respect visibility though. Let's see, let's try it out. I need more than, let's add an edge loop in here. Another way to add edge loops too um, is to use say the, uh, hold down control and shift and then select the slice curve brush or the um, slice rectangle brush. You can actually go through real quick 
and just slice, which will give you topology. So I'm going to do this little trick here on this. Get my hotkeys correct. Wait for it. Wait for it. We're going to get this done. It's going to happen. All right. Let's see if it works with visibility. Honestly, I don't know. I don't think I've ever done it. So let's see. Go into the crease area. Holding down control. Bevelin. Nope. No visibility there for you, Pedro. <laughs> you have to do everything. So Div Yang Art is asking, what stage should we disable Dynamesh? So Dynamesh, just in general, um, I talked about this more in some of the previous streams, uh, was created in order to generate uh, base meshes. And after you have your base silhouette done with Dynamesh, then you would turn off Dynamesh and then divide the model up and then add your details in it. So that would be the appropriate answer to what stage um, should you disable Dynamesh. So you want to first uh, take your model, uh, get the silhouette to where you want it, and then after it is generated, uh, go through and turn off Dynamesh and then divide the model up using traditional subdivisions and then go in and sculpt on it. So that's the, that's the correct answer for when should you disable Dynamesh. Uh, spotlight will not work with symmetry, so there's a question about that. It will only do one side, but after you have one piece generated, if you want it symmetrical, you can easily come to, so let's say, with this part here, and go into Spotlight. So I take this shape and I put it over here. We're gonna generate that quick. So I got that and that. If I want this to go on the other side, I can simply do a uh, mirror and weld down here, and that will now take it and put it on the other side. So that's the, the quick solution to saying, going through and creating something with Spotlight and then just know which axis your model's on and then use mirror and weld and it will take it from the one side and put it on the other and then you get your symmetrical result. So Shell, can you make a brush from a piece like this? Yeah, so you can, if you wanna make an insert mesh brush out of any of these, let's say I have this and I now wanna make it a brush, just go to the brush palette and there's a create option here and I can create an insert mesh brush right from this Oh, we didn't want to append that. Hold on. Let's do that again. Create insert mesh new. There we go. So now I have a new insert mesh. And now insert mesh objects, uh, there was a little one uh, Z Classroom Live I did too, was on just insert mesh creation. And this will allow you to take a, um, a used insert mesh as create. Let's, let's rephrase that. But basically I took an insert mesh. Um, and then with that, we can now use this to take this geometry and apply it to our mesh. So I've just taken this shape. I've already made it. I've turned it into a brush now. And now it's a brush. I can now start adding these all over. So if I have a model that I wanna make that has all these parts that consist of it, I can now use that with this brush and now I can make you know all sorts of crazy stuff with this. Now in addition to this, uh, in the, one of the last streams too, we talked about how you can turn these into negative brushes as well and then you can subtract with these too. So you can make these shapes, subtract with them. It's really open-ended, you can do a lot of stuff with it. So if you make something, you can always reuse it. You can then also project it, you can you know, divide it up, you can modify it so that it's really, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, Saeed's asking when to use texture as a displacement map. So you can definitely uh, displace objects. Uh, if you think of the number one easiest way is if you have a alpha you loaded in, that's a displacement map and you drag it on the surface, it's gonna displace. Uh, also for any subtool, if it has UVs, there is a displacement map area here in the uh, tool palette. So tool displacement map and here you can load your displacement map in. As long as that displacement map matches up to the UVs of your model, you can then use that. You can change the intensity of it and you can also uh, apply it to your mesh. Uh, another way you can kind of use displacement maps on models is through surface noise. And with surface noise, you can activate this, load in that alpha, and then you can apply it to your mesh and then apply, you can tile it, do what you want, and then displace that surface that way as well. So we're almost out of time here. I got a few more questions to try to get through here. Devin's asking, is it possible to snap a face to face object? So there's no like face to face snapping as per se where I have a model, say like this cylinder. Let me make this a poly mesh. And then I duplicate this and say I move this over 
and now I want to take this bottom face here and snap it to there. There's no real way um, to do that. So there's no direct snapping and snapping. Now what you could do is if you want to do this, there's a little thing you can do talking about turning stuff into a brush again. Um, so if I take this cylinder here and now I go to brush and I create a new insert mesh from this and do new, I now have a brush with that part. And now since I have that part, I can now drag this out on the model and you'll see that this cylinder here, when I drag out, I'm able to drag out to a specific point. So if I drag it out here, it's now gonna drag out at that area and now this is snapped, okay? so. You can do it that way if you take an object and then um, turn it into an instrument mesh and then whenever you draw the instrument mesh out, just draw it off of the surface you want to snap to and then that will allow you to drag it out. Right, So that's now snapped on there. Another thing you can do too if you want some sort of snapping, you can definitely um, snap to origin points. So in the macro tab up here, there is macros and one of the ones in here is snap to ground. So if I have say this object I can snap to the ground. I can also zero out my axes, so you can kind of mathematically figure out um, how that works. Uh, there are some tricks you can do with the transpose line um, as well, where you can generate snapping. Um, I think there's a few plugins you can find online that will allow you to do that, but basically, there's anything native um, inside of ZBrush, but basically you would take your objects and you could uh, set a transpose point and set another transpose point and then position them together and they would form a snap, but there's not really anything built in. Um, they'll let you do that. Uh, Softwind's asking, can you set a custom symmetry axis? So there is only going to be symmetrical axes based on the world, which is when you activate this symmetry here. You can activate radial symmetry, and then the other option for symmetry is local. Um, so those are your only real options for symmetrical points, um, those three options. If you activate local, this will look at the bounding box of your object. So with my cylinder here, if I activate X symmetry, you can see this is how it's doing. So I have this side and that side. And then if I take this and say, turn my floor here, and I move this out in the space, right? And I activate symmetry again. You can see this is the same symmetry. However, my pip is, one pip's over here, you can't see it, and the other one's here. So I have symmetry turned on, but you can see, oh, there you go, you can see it over there. You see it all the way over there, flashing. So that is world symmetry, which is what the default is. And that's what's gonna happen if you turn on this activate symmetry here. It's always gonna do it based off the world. Now, if you come over here and turn on local, this is going to change your symmetry to the local axis of your object. So it's gonna look at the bounding box of your subtool and then put the symmetry there. So you can see now I have the symmetry happening locally. So that's really the only way you're gonna be able to change your symmetrical points. So you can either do it locally based on the subtool or you can do it based on the world. So those are your two options for your symmetry stuff. Um, Lorenzo, you're asking about semi-transparent mobile keys. Um, so there's really no like way to get like transparent buttons or anything else in the AI that way. Um, what you see is kind of what you get. You can modify things, so like you can get stuff um, into like menus with hotkeys. Um, so you can get kind of like pop-up menus. If you come up here and you have a, um, a palette that you want to say hotkey to something, you just hold Control and Alt and click, and then if I set this to say the hotkey J, so Control and Alt will say, bring this little thing at the top that says assign a custom hotkey. So I can take a palette and do that, and then if I hotkey to say J, now when I press J, this will pop up. So you can kind of do that, um, but that's pretty much going to be your extent of any customization uh, in terms of uh, configurable buttons. Uh, SP Mongoose, I'm not sure, maybe. Um, he's asking if there's any way, it's someday that IMM brushes may be able to be loaded into ZBrush Core. It's always a possibility. Um, Mirdesh is asking, how do you array the object using Alt? Um, can you clarify that? Uh, to snap the model to the origin, uh, Zofo is asking, so there's a macro, and in here there's some zero options, so if I want to get that cylinder back, I can just zero it out with these. So that's in the uh, macro, macros here, and there's some zero options right through here. There's also one to snap to ground, that's handy, and there's also center mesh to world. So you have a few different macros that will go through and reposition your model. The positioning of your model is gonna be done through the geometry palette, and then in here there's a position area. 
and this is what's going to control the local positioning for your mesh. So you can also change these sliders to reposition a mesh. Uh, so I'm in North Carolina, so I'm on the east coast of uh, the U.S. And then everyone else, most of the other people in Pixelogic uh, are on the uh, west coast, so out in L.A. And then we have some other people that are in Japan and Europe, all over the place. Uh, all the macros tools, the ones that are listed here that I've been showing, will all be shipping. They all ship with 2020.1.3. Uh, if there's any that aren't working, uh, definitely go to the help area over here and submit a support ticket through this Pixelogic support button. I'm still reading these questions here. Um, Pedro, so with your question about the edging, um, there is, there's a QMesh edge and then there's one that's not QMesh. Try using the extrude, that may give you what you want. Um, if not, I'm not really quite sure what you're kind of looking to do. Let's see, that's where. Uh, the spotlight modeling came in, man, 2019, I think it was, was spotlight. All the versions have, have kind of, uh, <laughs> I keep going back and I'm like, what year was that? Uh, Torlene, yes, the size and position can be changed. Any rotational options would need to be done in the deformation palette. And down here, there's rotation. Um, you can also rotate with the Gizmo 3D. Um, those are your options for rotation. But there is no uh, exposed sliders. The rotation inside of ZBrush is not uh, held into any slider positions. So everything that gets rotated, its rotation gets reset after it's done. So there's no way to unrotate something um, in terms of, hey, let me zero this out back to the rotation. It's all going to be based kind of um, after you do a thing. Oh, okay, so the cloning thing, we'll show this once more, and then that is going to be it. So Radesh is asking about the cloning option. So we did this. So let's say I have an object, and I have the Gizmo 3D centered on it. And basically what I was doing, showing earlier, was I took this object and I created multiples of it. So I duplicated it. And this process is done by holding down Control and then clicking and dragging one of the move options on the Gizmo 3D. So if I hold Control and click and drag, this is going to take anything that's kind of unmasked on your mesh and it's going to create a duplicate. Now, after that, it could be done at that stage, but instead of being done there, if I hold down control and drag, and then after I have the position offset where I want it, if I release control and then continue dragging, it will keep repeating that offset till I stop. So that will allow you to come through and create one and then boom, 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 boom. And this should all be the same space between those. So that's the process there for that. So once again, hold down control, Drag, release control, and keep dragging, and it'll duplicate it out. So the right-click pop-up menu, if you've set it in preferences, um, come up here and hit config and do a store config um, and see if it saves after that, um, John's asking. If not, um, submit a ticket to uh, support. Just click, go to this Pixelogic support here and submit a ticket and tell them I told you to send that in, and they should probably send it to me and um, we can see if we can get that to um, automate for you so you don't have to do it every time. Yeah, there's no, you're not going to get any end guns. End guns won't do it. All right, quick ones, quick ones, let's go. <laughs> um, JoJo's asking about news plugins. Um, are you, so we do have a home page which will come up and this will display kind of the current news for uh, ZBrush here. And we update this quite often. Um, and in here you can go and click the links. But this is all done through the home page. Um, if that's what you're asking there. Um, and I think that is it. So making clones on the surface, uh, you can definitely clone the object. So if you keep doing this, you know, definitely can keep cloning these and make a whole bunch of them. Um, it's just holding control and dragging. It'll come through and do that. Um, it will only work with geometry and the Gizmo 3D is what you're gonna get. So you're not gonna end up with a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I'm not sure what the alert box 
background is there, uh, West? Uh, so there is this see-through option. I don't know if this is what you're talking about um, up through here. I don't know where else the, I'm unfamiliar with the alert box transparent background. Uh, someone earlier was asking about this thumbnail view. This was added in 2022. If you don't want this, um, there's a toggle for it in preferences. And then in here, there is a thumbnail view option here and you can turn this on and off. You can also change it from a silhouette to your object here. You can set the size of it. You can uh, export this out so you can make like little um, sprite images out of your models and then export out. You can change the size. You can magnify it to see what your model would look like pixelated. Um, so you can do all sorts of stuff, things with that. And then the controls for this other one, the cam view over here are also in preferences. That's a whole other area here. And there's a bunch of different ones you can load in and swap through. You can change the size of this too. But those are all in this preference menu. And you can, uh, if you save or turn them off, just go to preferences and do a store config and it should end up uh, doing it. Um, one quick one here, last one, changing scale. If you go to the Z plugin tab, there is a scale master plugin that lives in here. This will allow you to set an object to a scale. Um, it's gonna do it better based on uh, millimeters. And so if you have a scene set up with scale master and you take another scene that's set up with scale master, you'll be able to append those things back and forth and it should retain the same size. Oh, so the transparent option may be in this uh, interface option west. There's some uh, UI, where is it out of here? Customize UI, eye colors. In here, there may, there's maybe some transparent, there's a slider opacity in here, some switch button opacities. Try changing those and see if that resolves your issue. If not, uh, definitely uh, submit a ticket to support at pixelogic.com or just go to the help option here and go to support. All right, you all. Well, thank you for coming out. Um, I'll be streaming again next Wednesday at 2 p.m. And on Wednesday, we'll be doing a little bit more of this spotlight uh, modeling in here. And then we're going to talk about some of the filter processes to get a spotlight image and generate it to look like a 2D image. Um, once again, we have the trial of ZBrush is available. So if you have anybody that is looking for something to do while they're stuck at home, um, definitely send them to the ZBrush trial page here. They may want to pick up digital sculpting. Uh, we are doing developer streams from here on out until this pandemic is over. So you can catch us pretty much daily, one of us doing this. We also have others, some other great ZBrush live streamers that are on our channel as well. So definitely check them out. They stream for a lot, like two to four hours. So I stop at two, <laughs> two is a lot, but they sometimes go for four or more. So they're, they're crazy, a crazy bunch, but all definitely talented artists. Um, if you guys are doing anything with ZBrush at home, we definitely have a hashtag too, and you can post up images of what you've been working on. So we've been using these and restreaming them on our social media platforms as well. If you have any other questions or maybe things that I didn't cover that you want to find some information on, we do have this whole Ask ZBrush thing, and there's a lot of videos in here. So if you have any questions about something, uh, try going to YouTube and just searching Ask ZBrush and my keywords for what you're looking for, and there may already be a uh, video covering that. Uh, finally, for the stuff we covered today with the snapshot stuff, there is a whole tutorial on Z Classroom that goes through these processes as well. And it will take you from start to finish on how to generate this project here. So it'll go through the basics of Spotlight, how to manipulate the um, shapes, the 2D alphas, and then create them into geometry and get you this final result. So that's a six part uh, video series there. And these are broken down in about 10 minute sections. So if you're looking for more information on what we did today, definitely check that out. So I think that is it. So thank you all for coming out and stay safe. And until next time, happy ZBrushing. Take care.